Citizen Forum uh, today. The Global Citizen Forum was founded in 2013 by the founder chairman, Dr. B.K. Modi. And since then, we have sought to create and build public opinion well, around... I mean, well, have a speaker actually joining us from the USA, so she's probably doing the testing. So as I mentioned to you, the Global Citizen Forum was formed in 2013 by the founder chairman, Dr. B.K. Modi, and since then, uh, we have sought to create and build public opinion around issues that matter to us collectively as global citizens. In a world full of numerous opinions, uh, we provide a platform to build awareness and create innovative approaches to understand them and find possible solutions via mutual discussion and dialogue. We have held various events across the globe and in fact we hosted a conference at the UN headquarters itself in New York on the theme globalization and sustainable development. That was uh, during the lead up to the discussions on the UN sustainable development goals. On the first day of 2016, we begin with a very crucial topic Elitism using knowledge to create wealth. What really straddles across two different economic classes of civil society. The first one we have the world's poor, some of who live on as little as dollars one per day who cannot create wealth because of lack of opportunity. And then we have those professionals who are fortunate to receive global education with the opportunity to work in any country of their, choose, of their choice and create wealth for themselves and for others. The welfare of the society is not just the responsibility of the government. And today we want to debate the role that professionals who are responsible for the creation of that economic wealth play in creating a wealthier world based on more equitable distribution of wealth and resources. Higher education institutes who are the de facto producers of this race of professionals can also assist in this synergy. We had to have Dr. B.K. Modi actually who was supposed to open the discussion today uh, unfortunately, he's down with very high fever and, and a cold and cough, but he's still trying to see if he can join in. In fact, uh, as the founder chairman of the Smart Group, his forte has been to create wealth and introduce the most advanced global technologies to some of the developing parts of the world <coughs> to create a level playing field between the global developed and the global developing. To my left, I have Mr. Amin Tufani, who is the Vice President Strategic Relations with Singularity University and who has flown specially all the way from San Francisco uh, to be here with us today. Singularity University is one of the world's leading universities offering impact education programs for corporate professionals using exponential technologies to add value to the society, located in the campus of NASA. I believe the founders are NASA and Google among others. His illustrious education background includes an MBA from Stanford and an MBA from Harvard, making him the perfect person to talk on this subject today. In fact, amongst our stellar lineup of speakers, we have Mr. Robert E. Raman, who has joined us via video conference all the way from, we have him here on the screens, all the way from Atlanta, USA. A very good afternoon to you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yep. Hello? Ha, can you hear us? Mr. Robert Urban, can you hear us? I, I can hear you. Oh, lovely. Can That's great. So since he is, since it's 2.30 a.m. in the morning, uh, his time, uh, we'll give him the benefit of him speaking first. I'll quickly introduce him. Uh, uh, he's the MD of Strategos Financial, working on the sale of private placement transactions. He has previously worked with the Philadelphia Financial Group Deutsche Bank, NIC, and several other financial management firms. Amazing commitment from him that he's joining us all the way at 2.30 a.m. I'll request Mr. Robert Arman to, uh, to, to give his opening remarks. Mr. Robert? Mr. Robert? Yes. 
Um, uh, so we, we, we've, uh, you can start, uh, actually Dr. Modi could not be here, so you will be our first speaker for the day. And you know, after you've spoken, probably we can have the audience ask you questions and then you can uh, you know, retire for the day. <laughs> okay, well I hope I'm addressing uh, what Dr. Modi wanted. He said to talk a little about education and then about uh, wealth creation. Right. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay, should I begin? Yes, please. Well, I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you're, you're on the other side of the world, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I thank Dr. Modi for his kind invitation. Uh, just a little background. Um, I was an educator by training and uh, uh, educated in a very traditional Latin school, um, studied the university, uh, traveled and was fortunate enough because of my father to travel around the world and study in some very fine places where I took some uh, views on education, particularly in Vienna uh, from uh, Dr. Viktor Frankl. And that was a highlight for me and I thought I might share a couple of thoughts that uh, he shared with us when I was there. Uh, he's, long, he's since passed, but uh, he made it a point because he had suffered terribly as a victim of the concentration camps, what it's like to, you know, to suffer in this life and in very difficult conditions. And he taught me and all of us that where there's a why for life, uh, you can always find a how. And that education uh, has that task. And education today, in my personal opinion, needs some serious correction. And certainly in parts of the world, it doesn't even exist. And part of our task, I assume, as part of the Global Citizen Forum, is to see if we can help that. And I think part of the reasons we've not done a very good job there is that our education uh, doesn't, doesn't take into account an education of the affections. Uh, they're not included in any curriculum of which I am aware. And our emphasis today on technology, which I applaud sincerely, and I'm a big supporter, uh, creates other problems. And it's a problem that I've called a high-tech, no-touch culture. And I think one of the things that I would advocate is that there's so much data and information and at the risk of creating a word, I would say the data needs to be incensed. It needs to be made corporeal, tactile. Data needs to be able to teach us to let us smile or make us cry. In our education today, I think either educates without any direction at all, or create only one specific potential career, as it were. And I think it should be for multiple uh, careers. I also think that the, the advantage technology could bring in the ability to virtually travel we are right now um, and language training which is diminished around the globe but I think more importantly I was trained in the classics and went from there to banking which was a very strange transition but worked very nicely Aristotle tells us that all education is in wonder. And I think we need to give the children of the world wonder. What I think we really ought to take it as our responsibility to do is to try to give them a tomorrow. And there are lots of reasons why these things do not get done. And I'm going to take just a minute and 
can see why I just don't get done. Because not all evolution is ascension to a higher level. The road to the greater good has many digressions, wrong turns, and even dead ends. Educational development, while it exponentially increases the amount of information, sometimes doesn't advance recognition of what is truly significant. Technology of observation has become expanded to the outer limits of space and testable science pieces of invisible molecules. And yet some amazing transformations go unnoticed. Now, the body politic, as it's are often but bring themselves to a peak at times they succumb to illness. There's been a gradual, currently negative mutation in the body politic. A certain segment of our corpus has grown disproportionately with respect to the bear to a human body. The index finger has mutated like Pinocchio's nose. Here's many times that the sole function is to point this elongated and gorged Every, whatever area, education, even history, there is omnipresent. Who do you blame for failed educational programs? Who for social disparity? Who for ethical failures of major corporations? We blame for an economic loss or even ignorance. This is the burden personal responsibility by the simple act of pointing to someone else. This overdeveloped digit enables to disavow our own shortcomings and success of now, There are things that are hard to blame, but insisting that it is all is not the way. Now, that tells you all the reasons why things don't get done, like bringing water to people who are thirsty, homes to people that are homeless. But there's another reason, and, and one that we need and we can address. And that is, what does it take to solve those problems? It takes capital. Capital has requirements. And my father insisted that I get as fine an education as I could bear. He saw to that. He was not well educated. But when I entered the investment banking world, I encountered a problem of selling very specific financial uh, investments of, of a very difficult nature. And I wasn't doing any answer. I, student and me said, why can't you sell them? Said, These people are very educated. They want all kinds of data. They want reams of data. They're quants. They want all sorts of formulas. He said, did I send you to school to really get stupid? And the answer was, well, I don't know what you mean. He said, who are you selling to? Are they men? And, and I don't mean to be sexist, but at the time they were all men. And I said, so what? And he said, if I know that, I know one other thing. And I said, what's that? He said, if they're men, at one point they were little boys. And I said, so tell me again why that's important. He said, don't you understand? You find the story that little boy likes and he will buy what you have. Our task, as I see it, from the perspective of the forum, if we're going to try to do things of that nature, is to create the story that will bring capital to do the job for the social benefits and for the economic benefits. And it's incumbent upon people like those present today to create 
that story. And I hope that is of uh, some use to all of you. Now, in terms of time, please let me know if I've gone over or under because I can go with a, a case issue. Should I continue? Yes, please. Uh, you could continue for another maybe uh, three to four minutes. Uh, well, okay, then I'll try to be brief. I had a little longer thing. But uh, Dr. Modi also wanted to talk about uh, wealth creation and, and uh, you know, the, the failure that we encountered in education. We also encountered that in the, in the business world in one of the areas in which I was very active. That is in the senior living sector of the economy, which until up until 30 years ago was not even an industry. And they were just cottages that were cottage industry, facility here and facility there. And when I discovered that it even existed, all of the uh, projects that I found were bankrupt. So I began to investigate it and uh, discovered that these were happening like dominoes. And so we decided that uh, we needed to resolve that. Uh, we did. We re we restructured, which again goes back to education. Very few people, we know how to construct, we know how to destroy. Very few people know how to restructure, and restructuring in a, in a very realistic way. So after having done 10 or 11 or 12 of those and finding out that there were millions upon millions of dollars that were invested in these bankrupt senior living facilities, we decided that we had to create something that would solve the problem, and we created a conference to marry capital and management of these facilities, because until that time, large capital would not touch that industry. Now, I had a, a paper prepared on this. I think it's a little too lengthy, but suffice it to say that 30 years later, that industry, through the efforts, some of which were mine and some of which were a few other friends of mine, uh, have created billions of dollars in a massive industry of senior living. From nursing homes to assisted living to independent living, rehab facilities, all of which are doing amazingly well in finding large sources of capital. This can be done. If it can be done in one area, it can be done in another. There, there's, I recently saw the, the data from the Gates Foundation that had to do with the problems of women in the world. It can be the problems of children being educated in the world. Nothing changes. I will close with this. I would say if we're going to be successful in moving capital to do things that have social dividends, we're going to have to create a really great story. And I think it's incumbent on people that are here, people that are there where you are. And I would say this, and in particular in the senior living industry, in the part of the world where you are, it is, it is ripe for development there. Uh, I hope that some of these things are helpful to anyone. Uh, there are questions that any of you would like to ask on any of these areas. Uh, more than happy to take them, and if not, please let me know. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robert Raman. I think that was uh, really thought provoking, and uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we have some questions for you, starting with Mr. Tupan. Dr. Raman, thank you so much. This was a wonderful training. Yes, I can. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm losing your... 
Yeah, I can hear, I can hear you now. I mean, how the microphones? <laughs> okay. Is this better? Yes, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. I was saying, uh, Dr. Beth, by nature of the gathering we have here, we're all focused on uh, the problems and framing of the problems and potential solutions. Uh, and you've done a fantastic job of framing the conversation for us. Uh, what gives you hope about the future? Let's, let's have a slight uh, departure from the problems and uh, what gives you hope? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I'd be happy to because because uh, I've been in situations that are hopeless before. Uh, that industry that I talked about was a, a clear failure and money wouldn't touch it. It, it took, it took a, a, a major, major effort and then, you know, I'll be candid, it took four or five years to, to bring together uh, the capital with that industry and what we're talking about is, I think, even a greater task. So it's going to require a serious effort. But I, but I think when you get people who are intelligent and who care, and we have all the information, and, and I, I said a few things that I really meant, we need to end sense our data. We know what needs to be done. We need to, I am a salesman. And I know this, nothing happens until somebody sells something. We have to sell social dividends and show why they really yield economic dividends. It's real, but it takes time to tell that story and you have to put it together and you have to put it together in a, in a very intelligent way. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions? Robert I think folks are cognizant of time in California for you. So, uh, but listen, you've all been very kind. I hope it, I hope it was uh, of some use to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Is that all right? Uh, yes. It'll be a pleasure for us, but I was just thinking because you know he can only listen from this mic. So probably I'll give this mic to the speaker. Okay. All right. So uh, I also welcome Mr. Dilip Modi, Mr. Nikhil Rumta. Uh, uh, Mr. Dilip Modi, I request you to come to the mic. Now come to the man of the hour, Mr. Amin Tufani. <laughs> I introduced him to you. Uh, he's come all the way from um, San Francisco to join us. He's come to Singapore for the first time. Um, Amin, I'll hand over to you.
is aware of that. But that is not the full picture. I believe we have a failure of collective imagination. Collective imagination. Uh, is education part of the solution? Of course. It's very much it's part of the solution. And I think we wouldn't be here having this conversation if we didn't believe strongly in the role of education. But classical education, I don't believe, is, uh, is a full answer. The truth is, if you look at the poorest of the poor, yeah, you're closer. Okay. Uh, if we look at the poorest of the poor uh, in the world, they have never been as well educated as they are at this point in human history. We have educated our poor extremely well and better than any other period in human history. Uh, but extreme poverty persists. The trend is great for the first time in human history since we started recording extreme, extreme poverty. Uh, less than 20% of the population is living in extreme poverty. But the speed with which we're moving in that direction is, is not fast enough. Classical education was created in the image of the needs of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, those guys needed to dump a lot of information on a lot of people. But information has become abundant and cheap. Through the internet, through all the technologies that we have, and we need to have a slight departure from a technical education to one that addresses the problem of imagination. Similarly, there's no shortage of people who have been educated, but who unfortunately live under the poverty line. At the same time, there's no shortage of people who live in affluence, an affluent lifestyle, uh, who have not had formal education. So something is missing, and we need to rethink our paradigms around education a different type of education. Uh, I know three of the 10 richest people in the United States. I have met them. Uh, and their life stories are quite inspiring. I uh, had great conversations, and, and you can't help but be encouraged and motivated by what they have accomplished. From another neighborhood in my city, I also happen to know three people who I consider to be among the poorest of the poor in the United States. And I've had the privilege of reflecting on these six men. And let me tell you, they have much more in common than most of us are comfortable acknowledging. We like to believe in a world that is meritocratic, where upward mobility is predicated on your capabilities. But the truth is, we are slaves of our circumstances, and we tend to externalize blame and internalize credit. But a lot of it depends on circumstances. So rich and the poor, they're quite, familiar, they're quite similar. But there's one element that I have noticed that is extremely different about the two groups. And that is the stories that they tell themselves. The rich tell themselves stories of abundance, of success. They tend to internalize credit, and they tend to externalize blame. It's a very confident narrative. The poor tend to have a story of scarcity, of failure. And this is quite intuitive, right? Each group, uh, their, their stories capture the dominant narrative of their lives. That's what they see, stories of scarcity or abundance. But I've come to believe that the direction of causality is not quite what meets the eye. Effectively, it is easy to think of people's stories about themselves as a reaction to their lives. I believe there's an element of truth to that, but also the other way around. What we think about the most tends to become our reality. We tend to attract into our lives our dominant thoughts. Think about scarcity and losing money for months, and monitor the effect on your bank account. I've tried this, and I've tried the opposite, uh, where I've thought about abundance for an extended period of time and seen the effect. It is true. We attract into our lives what we think about the most. So in essence, what we're talking about here is uh, circumstances that shape dominant thoughts, and then dominant thoughts that in turn shape lives. But let me be clear, let me pause here for a second. 
This is not at all a story of blame. It is easy to decontextualize this conversation and say that we're blaming the poor for some failure to imagine their way out of poverty, to imagine and crawl their way out of poverty. It is not at all about that. It is very hard to be self-referential. It is very hard to reframe your dominant narrative about your life without external help. So in essence, what I'm talking about is an opportunity for a new type of education that addresses the challenges of imagination in addition to what we conventionally expect of classical education. It was uh, really uh, uh, an important revelation that what we think about tends to shape our lives. That made a lot of sense for me when I thought about the rich getting richer. It's probably no surprise at all, because the story perpetuates itself, and also the poor not being able to come out of poverty. It was Buddha who said, uh, what do you think you become? I've had the privilege of uh, studying at Stanford and Harvard universities, as Preeti mentioned. At, uh, at Harvard, I studied economic policy and international development. Effectively, I focused on poverty. And at Stanford, I got an MBA from the business school. I'm very grateful for the education that I got, and especially the fact that I could, uh, I was afforded the opportunity to attend the two schools at the same time. This meant a lot of flying back and forth on the two coasts of the United States. Uh, but it really created an opportunity to compare, to compare how people who focus on poverty talk about stuff, and how people who are focused on profits talk about stuff. Each narrative is valid. Each narrative is necessary for our lives. But here is a dichotomy that I noticed that is quite troubling. I noticed that we tend to afford the poor a very different type of tool set than the tool set we afford the rich. We effectively have tools that we apply when we're solving rich problems, and a different set of tools that are applied when we're solving poor people problems. And the challenge is they do not overlap, and they should. Let me give you an example. One of the largest, uh, effectively, unfortunately, the key financial innovation, the only financial innovation that has entered the discourse of poverty alleviation in the last 50 years has been around microfinance. Let me be very clear. I really admire microfinance. I appreciate the philosophy behind it. And I've had the good privilege of having extended conversations with Dr. Mohamed Yunus, the founder of the Grameen uh, Foundation. And they're doing wonderful work. But let's pause for a second. A microfinance loan uh, requires an interest payment of around 100% on an annual basis. When I found that out, I, I went back to my business school and I offered a whole bunch of MBA students a loan of about a 100% annualized interest rate. Of course, not only were they not interested, they were offended. They were offended. Uh, and before you say default rates, because I know it's, it's very easy to say the poor have very high default rates, that's why the risk adjusted interest rate is very high. That is not true. The actual default rate of microfinance is lower than the aggregate US default rate for loans. In fact, this is such a lucrative business that a lot of Wall Street firms have started investing in microfinance. And to me, it is quite extraordinary uh, that the poor have become a source of profits as opposed to a sink of profits. If we pause, pause and think about this, uh, the big picture of it, really the challenge is that the two narratives don't overlap. The tools we have for the poor and the tools we have for the rich. And am I creating the echo, by the way? No, it's fine. No, okay. um, I do believe we need an upgrade. We need an upgrade to our education system. We need to create opportunities for people to reimagine their lives. But I'm not sitting there waiting for our education systems to be evolved. Some of our educational elements might never be evolved. They might need to be disrupted. And that's a, that's a fair outcome, in my opinion. So I'm working, I manage a small hedge fund in addition to my main job at Singularity University. I manage a small hedge fund on the side and we're building a hedge fund for the poor. 
anybody from finance can tell you the power of leverage. When you, when you have leverage, when you apply leverage to finance, to funding, uh, a dollar can do the job of $10. So we're creating a model where people can actually benefit from the financial markets. It is very strange that every single dollar that enters the financial markets is typically a leveraged up. But every single dollar that enters international development and poverty alleviation conversations is unlevered. Yeah, there is no reason for that. There is no reason why we should accept the status quo. We could, we could really upgrade this situation for the better. And through the hedge fund for the poor, I hope to create two specific outcomes. Uh, I mentioned leverage. The other one is a mind shift. Imagine if you have a dollar, that dollar generating a return, uh, having access to a financial instrument that could tap into the financial markets for you and generate a return. And a lot of the risk would be underwritten by donor agencies, right? Instead of those dollars coming in un unleveraged, they could be leveraged up and underwrite the risk in a lot of these propositions. What this does is that it allows a reimagination of working for money versus money working for you. Money working for you is a dominant narrative if you live an affluent lifestyle. Working for money is what we expect a lot of middle class and poor people to do. So striking the balance and operating those uh, conversations, I think, would be critical if we were to reimagine uh, the, the opportunities we have for financial inclusion. By the way, financial inclusion, access to banking systems and, uh, and financial institutions, has been shown to be the strongest predictor of, um, or I should say lack of access to financial institutions, is the strongest predictor of extreme poverty. Uh, it is actually a stronger predictor than absolute income or bad purchasing decisions. Uh, there's a wonderful book called The Portfolio of the Poor, and it's a longitudinal 10-year study in India, Bangladesh, South Africa, and a few other regions, and they realized whether you have access to a financial institution really was the key determinant of how exposed you were to extreme poverty. So uh, through the hedge fund for the poor, I do hope to move the conversation in that direction to a certain extent. Every time I start a new project, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, um, so every time I start a new project, I try to find somebody who has done what I'm trying to do. And this is not to uh, receive technical know-how. This is not to uh, get, get, get a technical solution to what I'm trying to accomplish. This is to address the imagination challenge. It is very hard to believe something is possible unless you have seen it. Seeing is believing. So whereas a lot of people start projects and they try to focus on gathering technical solutions, I try to address the imagination solution first. Because if you believe, then the rest falls in place. I think it is important to keep track of this dichotomy when we talk about the poor as well. There are technical solutions that are going to be necessary to empower and create upward mobility but there are also imagination solutions that we need. And that's really the opportunity to think about a different type of education, because we ultimately live in a very abundant world. And the truth is that our reach exceeds our imagination. Our reach exceeds our imagination. So I hope 2016 will be a year for all of us to expand our imagination and help those of us, those people around us and those in need, the less fortunate, to also expand their imagination so that it's closer to their reach. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Amin. I think that was really thought-provoking. We hope that Singularity University will produce more professionals like yourself who can change our thought process. What you think you become, I think, very powerful words and microfinance a powerful tool to empower the poor. Um, uh, would you like to take the questions now or later? Really, We throw the floor open for questions for him. Okay. 
find uh, fascinating. Uh, we had a big chat last night, but today I'm so. That's a problem. Is it this one? No, no, that one. Is that okay? Which is the problem? Perfect. Yeah. So I'm just taking on two points. One on education. The one you talked about imaginations and you know creativity. I mean, after doing all my degrees, some seven years back is what I got into in a neuro linguistic program, which is nothing but the power of subconscious and unconscious mind and what imagination and seeing is believing, all that. But it's not been taught in the schools, schools has been still mucked up. So the power of psychology, how it can be important at that stage, is very important. So what I could do, I'm doing it through my, you know, delivering speeches, etc. But we have to see how this education, I'm talking about NLP or Mindscape, or a Lewis's methodology. It's all seeing and believing in that kind of answer. And that allows the people to taste the sweet, and that's, they're able to imagine and get what they want to get it out. That's on education. Now the second part which you talked about, how do we empower people? You know, in terms of the poverty, how do we eliminate poverty? In our experience, you know, I'm with a company called Collab International, that's about 3 million farmers. In 1994, I remember when I went to Nigeria and seen an up country, a very small farmer who doesn't even have to stay. They don't even food three times to eat food. The, the model for us is not microfinance. We give money, we call it a local buying agent, who buys, buys these commodities and collect and give it to us in a tight cloth. After 20 years, in last year, when I visited that place, the guy's three kids are studying in London. Right? So what matters is if you can give the feed, the food, like you said, food is available, but education people can wait. But if they don't have food to eat morning to evening, there's no way they can get it. And the way in which governments are supporting today is by giving charity and donations. It's not teaching them how to catch the fish. We just distributing fish. And he doesn't know what to catch up. So as corporates, we have learned we don't give one dollar donation, but we allow people to empower so that they can earn and then you know make the level of change. I just want to look upon you to share some thoughts, what we can do in that kind of things to eliminate the poverty, which will be the lead, leading indicator for education to change. No, I concur. I, I applaud you for for uh, the philosophy behind your actions and also the magnitude of the impact that you're potentially creating. Uh, I, I want to caution us. Uh, I, I've been part of this conversation. Having, I, I was basically the poverty guy at business school and the business guy at poverty school. So <laughs> I've seen both sides of this. And one thing that I've noticed, and I'd like to caution all of us, is to expect too much from the poor. You know, we. It is easy to look at a person and decontextualize them and say, why are you chosen? Uh, again, it's very difficult to reframe your own life if you haven't seen the alternative. Right? So there is, there's a bit of momentum that needs to be created, and it sounds like you're creating that exact momentum. The other part of the challenge that I see, quite frankly, is people with this kind of education to create financial instrumentation, to create these types of innovative solutions, that do empower as opposed to just give the fish, but to create an environment for fishing, uh, those folks, quite frankly, don't enter a lot of the international development poverty conversations. So there is a void in, in skill sets that we need to address as well. That, to me, is a big opportunity, um, uh, and also more of a short-term solution. Long-term solution, longitudinally, of course, an upgrade to our education system. And the examples we provide for people to reimagine their lives as a solution, but short-term, um, there are many, many opportunities to attract more professionals to, uh, to engage in this conversation. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I, you know, uh, I have a slightly different take on some of this, and I'm talking about it with you all. But just to go back to what I could say, and what you said, Professor Tafani, I, I, I understand that you cannot put too much of a burden on the board. I see it more in terms of inequality, but I'll come to that in a second. Maybe later. Uh, there is a program that is very, uh, very, very successful in Brazil. You're probably aware of it. I'm not, I'm not Portuguese speaking, so I'm not going to take a Portuguese study. Uh, it's actually family grants. Okay. This came about in President Lula. He came from a very backward, uh, sort of, when I say backward, I mean poorer section of society. And he came up with this program called Family Grants, which is essentially giving money to the poor. Uh, you know, all the, you know, the rich institutions in this world decide what the poor is going to do and not going to do, which he, saw, which he said was unfair. He said, basically, that the poor, poorer sections of society know what to do, but if you give them money, they will put it to the best use that they want to put it to. 
It's a highly successful program. Uh, Copy, in fact, investment banks, if you've got a finance background, have looked at it, Goldman Sachs has looked at it. Uh, various nations of the world have similar problems, as Brazil's poor and Brazil's government has have looked at it. And it's become a model to, 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 uh, to copy, actually. Uh, it's actually called family grants in Portuguese term for it, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, and this is giving money to the poor, but without any of this microfinance interest and all the rest of it. But making sure that you actually extract certain promises from the poor, otherwise you're suspended and basically bounced out of the program. Which is, you've got to make sure your kids go to uh, school. You've got to make sure that they have access to health facilities. And that, I mean, of course, you have this Tibaki sword hanging over your head, but what it has done, and it has been a huge success, the elite, you know, just looking at that, uh, the heading of this, uh, of this program, the, the rich are not too concerned about it because it's really a very small fraction of what they pay in terms of taxes, which goes towards this. But as you said quite rightly, the dollar goes a long way for the poorer people. And they have been extremely successful in doing this. It's something that, very akin to what you've just said, right there, okay? But it's been a highly successful program and people should actually look at it as a model. It's in Brazil and it's, I think, still continuing under the current administration. Uh, that's my thought of it. No, wonderful, thank you for sharing that, absolutely. It is a departure from old models where you would give the money and ask specific, uh, you, would, you, would, uh, you would give it for specific reasons. Yeah. Now we link it to specific outcomes. I think it's very, very much congruent with the whole notion of financial innovation for upward mobility. Yeah. Anyway, my take on this is slightly different in terms of inequality, but we can talk about that. We'd we'll love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. I'm from Singapore. Thank you for the nice compliments about the security. But even in Singapore, we have a problem. And the problem is income inequality. We have the rich, and we have the very poor. Nearly 10% are below the poverty line, so to speak. We have a government which concentrated on a philosophy, because we grew up in a state of situation where it was survival. So at that time, the words were, if you don't work, you die. Nobody owes you a living. This was the philosophy of those period. Then we became affluent, we are now for third, fourth, per capita. But in spite of that, we have quite a bit of income inequality under so the government has slightly shifted, very slightly shifted, to socialization with a capital phase or capitalist phase. But the problem is it doesn't reach everybody. So you have a problem where people are falling through the cracks. Only very much later you find that they have fallen through the cracks. Now how do you address the situation where you can anticipate somebody falling through the cracks, because either through lack of uh, support, community support, the government can provide a basic social policy network, but at the individual level, it becomes a challenge. We run a small program called Helping People from Falling Through the Cracks. We try as much as possible. Just last week, or two weeks ago, somebody died, committed suicide because he didn't have $12,000 to pay his loans. Very tragic. In a situation like affluent Singapore, this beats you and it strikes at the heart. Your comments, please. No, I applaud you for, for recognizing the issue and, and working towards it. I would probably defer to my colleagues who are better positioned to comment on inequality. Inequality um, is, a, is an issue that affects all of us. I've thought about it quite a bit. But ultimately, I come at it from a technological point of view. I think with exponentially growing technologies, information technology, biotechnology, and nanotechnology, 
ultimately we're going to see the whole of society lifted, but that does mean that the 1%, the top cohorts of society, uh, the very rich will become ultra rich, but the poor will probably be uh, a little better off. Uh, ultimately, it is, a, it is a problem that I'm not sure is fully understood in its full extent of implications. We're all implicated in this problem. It's the type of problem that will come back to affect everybody. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. I'm sure this will be a theme throughout the hour. In fact, we have the benefit of uh, some eminent persons and panelists present here today. Uh, to start with, can I request uh, uh, Tan Sri Dato Asay to please say a few words? Good afternoon for this, uh, to everybody and happy new year. I think this opportunity to be here. I'm from Malaysia actually. Mr. Tashri is the mayor of Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> I'm, I'm from Malaysia. In fact, uh, we studied about almost the same time with Dr. Modi in California. But uh, I think Dr. Modi is more clever than me. So I really, really very successful in business. But I myself, after I graduate uh, from the University of California, I, I go back to government service. So I was uh, from junior officers in government until the, until the, to the level of secretary to the whole ministry. Prior to that, I was uh, the general immigration Malaysia, where we have to facilitate people coming to the country, uh, make easy, for investors to come to Malaysia uh, under the leadership of Mahathir at the time. So. But uh, I retired probably uh, uh, end of 2007. After that, I joined uh, JLC's, I was chairman of Postal Service. After that, uh, they appointed me as a mayor of Petrojaya, the administrative capital of Washington to, <laughs> to Malaysia. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I also uh, currently uh, president, uh, the chairman of one university. It's a unique university that I would like to share to, to everybody here. It's a university by the name of Lim Kok Wei. Lim Kok Wei is a Chinese, but uh, many Malaysians thought that Malaysia is a place for the Malays, place like me. Target, my friend here is Indian. So is a Chinese name can be used as a university. Very quite interesting. When I studied in Malaysia, my first four, my first degree, there were only two universities. But right now we have got 60 universities in Malaysia. Half private and half public. But one of the problems that we are facing right now is this unemployment. After other people can achieve. It's a serious problem. Uh, many universities, especially the public universities, they cannot market their yeah, graduate mm, to the open market. They have to depend greatly on the government service kind of thing. But the university that I'm chairing, Lim Kowai University, is like United Nations. I think Master Pani used to be uh, uh, working in Malaysia as High Commissioner of Singapore. Right? Yeah, and, you know, we have got students from 147 countries uh, from everywhere. And then we have got campuses also everywhere in the world. We've got five in Africa, Middle East, in China, in Korea, in Indonesia, in Phnom Penh, that kind of thing. So. But uh, what we are teaching is the subject that mainly related to new, new ideas and new, uh, mainly is something to do with innovation and creativity. We don't have, uh, the only thing that we don't have at the university is faculty of medicine. We've got engineering also, but related to ICT. We do brandings, cinema, things like that. But one thing I have to tell you here is this, like in, in Malaysia, all our graduates from our universities, none of them 
unemployed because we provide graduate that uh, demanded by the market in Malaysia. This is very, very important. And another important factor that I have to emphasize here is this. Our students, uh, when we graduate from our university, they are speaking English like the one, the one they, they are graduated from Stanford or Cambridge, or from uh, Oxford or Cambridge. This is, uh, uh, this is important because we are talking about, uh, right now, this is uh, ICT, we are talking about borderless world, borderless world kind of thing, and free mobility kind of thing. So I have to congratulate, congratulate Dr. Modi for the opportunity given, and he has got connection in Malaysia as well. He is expanding his business in Malaysia as well, and he chose to become citizen of Singapore for this purpose and great promoter of global citizenship. Thank you. Thank you, Dato Sri. Um, uh, can I request uh, Dato Pradeep is here, who's sitting next to him, uh, one of our panelists. Can I, he's executive chairman of Grand Paradise Holdings from Malaysia. Can I request him to say a few words and give us quick comments? Thank you, Priti. Uh, I mean, your your talk was very, very thought-provoking. Congratulations, and I think you uh, you know the subject really well. A couple of things that crossed my mind after listening to you. One thing was, I think you're coming from the perspective of the Western world, a poor person in a Western world. I think there's a lot of difference between a poor person in the Western world and a poor person in the eastern or underdeveloped countries. What creates poverty in the western world is not what creates poverty in the eastern world. So we have to look at it from uh, both sides of the coin. The other thing that obviously you know but maybe you did not mention it today is one of the things that creating poverty in my view in the world today, two of the things, but I normally put them together, is politics and religion. You know, I with no offense to anybody here, but I think both the institutions have a tendency of wanting to control the minds of people, the way they think uh, they ought to, to function. So politics and politicians play a certain role and I think that creates poverty because in the uh, underdeveloped world, uh, politics is about creating wealth for themselves. You know, it's about the, the grab phenomenon. And I think to, to, to some extent, uh, religion is also doing that. Religion is controlling people and making people believe and think in a certain way that uh, so-called leaders think that they should believe and think so that they can stay and remain as leaders. So I just want to leave this thought. It's a very difficult subject, but I just want to leave this thought with you. How will you reconcile this eventually, firstly from uh, the perspective of the Western world and the Eastern world, and the factors that contribute to the creation of poverty? Thank you. Cognizant of the source. 
and ultimately include that in the solutions that we find. So I concur 100%. Uh, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on the religious or the political aspect. I think it's a broader conversation that requires proper context setting. Uh, but uh, there are, our societies are aspiring to be meritocratic, but they don't always function that way. And whether there is a perverse motivation that creates that, or it's just a lack of proper planning, so probably every person in this room probably has a very strong opinion on that. So I'll leave it to that. But thank you for coming. We have Ambassador Kishan Pandey here in Director of the Institute of South Asian Studies, Singapore, and prior to this, he was Singapore's High Commissioner to Malaysia and has also served as Singapore's permanent representative to the UN in Geneva. Would you like to? I thought I had the first bite of the cherry, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. I just want to share with you a real life experience on tackling poverty, promoting development. And this was a story of a Swiss banker. He had gone to Bali, one of our resort islands and so on, and was walking along Ubud. Ubud is the high class area where the rich walk about. And then he saw in every corner women holding babies and begging. So he thought it was very you know, incongruous in a place like Bali. And uh, this, this man, his name was Daniel Alba, a Swiss banker. Daniel was there for three days. But when he saw this, he decided to postpone his leave. He followed these ladies up the mountain, a three-hour tough trek up the mountain. And what he saw just shook him. It was barren, nothing there, no economic activity. The women, the men were layabouts, no jobs. And the women had to come down and beg. There was no water. So after begging and going up, they had to come down to get water. So Daniel decided to do something about it. What he did was he got them to start planting cashew nuts, cashew, cashew trees, and rosella leaves. So in a small way, not as big as all of them, but still. And he managed to, when the, when the fruit started, when the trees started fruiting, he got them to pack it up and decided, sold it off to Switzerland, the only market he knew. And he sold $220,000 worth of cash accounts and other days. And in the process, he's now, he's now at the job for 11 years. He has lifted 5,000 families out of poverty. But what I'm telling you, why I'm telling you this story is somehow that we got into the act, my friend Naftej and I, and we have become the local agents for those cashew nuts. So the next time I see you, I'll come to sell you those cashew nuts. Because every cent goes directly to the place. One of the problems about giving to so-called poverty projects, half of it is siphoned off. Half of it is siphoned off. So we need to look at projects which go directly to the people. The people are empowered. And as a result of Daniel's work, 5,000 families now are above the poverty line. They were below 50, and within a period of 11 years, has brought it up to 100. Not only that, he has set up schools, he has set up a water catchment area. So any, anybody going to Bali next time, let me know. I will get you to visit this place. Leading positions in various healthcare industries. 
Thank you. Uh, happy New Year to you all. And I guess uh, I fit into the elite uh, group of people who are uh, in, in this environment. And I want to digress a little bit from what has been discussed. You know, I find it very interesting when the rich talk about the poor and, and how to make uh, money out of uh, improving the lot of the poor, which is good. Capital requires, uh, capital needs to be spent, money has to be made, and the right thing needs to be done. But I want to take you back into something which I think is more important, and which is what the way I look at it, is that as mankind, are we becoming more intelligent? Or are we becoming less intelligent? Um, has something changed over the years? And we're talking about the fact that we've been around for a couple of million years or more. Our human brain actually has evolved into three different parts. The more modern one, which has been around for the last 30, 40,000 years, if I could put it, then going back to many millions of years before that. The size of the human brain also changed as the female had to move from running for her life to save her life, which required her to have a smaller pelvis, so the size of the brain and the skull would be smaller, to a more sedentary use of tools, the ability to uh, kill predators, the pelvis size changed and the human brain changed. And so we've actually evolved from the size of the human brain all along. And there's a lot of social psychological discussion on the differences between the poor and the rich in terms of what their brains are. Are brains different? And I'm sure you've seen so many studies where they've taken identical twins which have the same genetic makeup, identical twins, and bring them up in two separate environments to see whether the outcome would be the same or different. Now what is very interesting is that the intelligence quotient in the Western world, if I were to use it, the developed world, which was thought to have become stagnant, is actually not stagnant. It's growing, but it's only growing at maybe around 6 to 7 percent. Which, if you take the margin as being very high, it's a pretty good thing. So the, the delta difference in a lesser developed or an emerging environment is much more because the people seem to grow much faster if they're given the opportunity. And I think what, as we've talked about, the most important thing is to give the poor an opportunity. So whether we talk about it from a microfinance perspective or capital or programs, it's the opportunity to be able to succeed. And if they have that opportunity, they're able to succeed. When I look at education, to some of us, we are taught the same way as we were taught 40 years ago. Right? And that can't be because knowledge has changed. Knowledge has improved. It's become huge. It's fast. We have a phenomenon. We sent uh, Yuri Gagarin, a cosmonaut, in the 1960s. We were monitoring his heartbeat in 61 from there to the Earth. But the use of telemedicine as a remote healthcare delivery mechanism, whether it's in an Indian reservation in Arizona or in a small village in Delhi uh, in India, is still not there. So we have a huge gap in, in how we are using technology to be able to deliver value to the poor. And I always look at it, value to the poor. And out of that comes capital, uh, uh, capital uh, return on capital, and et cetera. And all the economists and the gurus will tell me what a good IRR and a ROCE, et cetera, et cetera, is. But all of that is good. You know, one of the most important things in a growing child, or a growing child's mind, is to be stimulated by adult vocabulary. And just think about what I've just said. In most poor homes, you have four or five children. You have one parent, maybe, if one is lucky. Right? And, and the children grow up using what we call child vocabulary until they have an opportunity to either go to a school or they go to a college where they learn adult. 
the poor people don't have that opportunity for education. And I think that's where we need to look at. I'm going to pose a question to all of you. Today, one has to think in what we call abstract logic. So if I were to tell you what is common between a dog and a rabbit, most of us would answer saying that the dog eats the rabbit or they both have four legs, one runs faster. The logical answer to that is that they're both mammals. So I just wanted to see that there's no right or wrong answer to this, but there are so many different ways of looking at the same problem, which I think what we've lost out is the fact that we try to handle things out to the poor people. I've seen poor people. I've seen kids eating earthworm and lava from the ground. That's what I call poverty. They're yearning to learn. There's no school. There's no education. There's no healthcare facilities. None of that exists in, in certain parts of India, I can tell you, and in Africa. They just don't exist. We are, and you're right, when we talk about a person who's hungry, it doesn't matter whether he's in America or he's in India. A hungry person is a hungry person. And I think their sense of achievement is really the next meal. And if they can get that, they achieve. So I, I hope that we can look at how we build the, an, an educational system and give an opportunity to the, to the people who don't have that opportunity or the economically weaker section so that they can then develop and build that. And I do believe that we unfortunately are under the swarms of the socio, economic, political, religious systems in the world which then dictate us in whichever way we have to go. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We have Thomas Iliakis with the co-founder and executive chairman of the Yuzu Corporation, one of the world's first conversational commerce companies. He's been involved in the world of mobile telecommunications for 30 years. Thomas. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, you mentioned your, your education, which, which indeed uh, was, was uh, both impressive and interesting that you, you went, went both to Harvard and, and to Stanford at the same time. Uh, I have uh, lived here in Singapore for the last uh, 20 plus years, and I have two children who here have attended um, the United World College one of the international schools. Uh, my older one graduated this spring and, and among her uh, grade mates there were a number of students, not too many but nevertheless, uh, who won uh, admission to top universities such as Stanford and Harvard but couldn't do it because they didn't have the money and they couldn't get uh, uh, scholarships either. So they had, to, they had to decline although they had been, been admitted. I come from, from um, a part of the world, from Finland, where education is completely free, all the way through, from, from uh, grade one all the way through universities as one, one foreign student because uh, education in universities is free also for foreign students. Recently uh, said in an interview that uh, the Finnish government pays for everything except the coffee at Starbucks. And, and that's, that's close to the truth. And the same model you have in all the Nordic countries and this goes back to the time in the 60s and the 70s where also in the Nordic countries there was indeed extreme poverty. And uh, the social democratic governments that were in power in, in all the Nordic countries in those days decided that education was the key to wealth for, for people and that uh, education therefore had to be free for everybody so that the lack of money would not hinder anybody from, from getting a good education. Now there are nowadays critics of this system saying that uh, when you have free education, the best talent, the best professors go overseas to universities that pay them better. Uh, I'm sure there is a bit of truth in that, but it's also a, a, you know, a statement with modification to uproot your family. It's not that easy and, and, and money is not the only motivation, for, especially for educators. I would like to, to hear your views on, on, on uh, free education versus versus uh, paid education. Obviously, uh, there is a cost to free education, which in the Nordic system is high taxes. And uh, that's a model that uh, is not uh, easily uh, applicable to, to all societies. But nevertheless, I would like to, to hear, hear your views on this. Well, my views are uh, free education is fantastic. It, it is predicated, its success is predicated on creating a competitive environment for the educators. And quite often that is an, 
that was the missing part. That was the part that was ignored. And brain drain ends up uh, affecting the outcome of dynamics. Uh, ultimately, I think a lot of the success in Europe about social services comes from an abundant mindset. And, and of course, the historical context that allowed for that mindset, the inflow of capital and cash, and uh, because of all the entrepreneurial efforts and opportunities they had around the world. I do believe that if we recognize that we live in an abundant world, the fact that marginal cost of productivity is going to zero, marginal cost of consumption is going to zero, we're effectively entering a very interesting era where pretty soon technological unemployment will not only be uh, scary, not be scary rather, uh, it will actually be desirable. Uh, if we look at human history, uh, a lot of us tend to forget that we all, uh, as humans, we have to work seven days a week. But through technological unemployment, we all work five days a week. This year, Larry Page from Google said maybe four days is enough. Nobody's complaining about that type of unemployment, right? It seems okay. Uh, point here is I'm a big believer in technological um, empowerment. Uh, we at Singularity University, we focus on the longitudinal effects of what we call exponentially growing technologies, nanotechnology, biotechnology, and information technology. And what we're seeing is that people are empowered to do what businesses used to do, and businesses are empowered to do what governments used to do think about Google. If Google enters two additional uh, domains, healthcare and insurance and a few other things, it, it's practically indistinguishable from what a government used to do a few years ago. And it is this kind of stuff that should really encourage us to think about an abundant world, not a scarce world. And if abundance is there, then social services need to be lifted. I do believe we're stuck in a dichotomy of capitalism versus socialism. And that's why a lot of the conversation around this is polarized. But if we get over that, and I fully believe we will, uh, free education should very much be part of the education and part of the picture of that abundant world. Thank you. Uh, so we have Jay Potter, who is the partner in charge of Gibson Dunn Singapore office and Asia Pacific region. Jay, you wanted to? Yeah, just very quickly, just. Uh, just a few comments. Uh, I think just going back to the actual topic of elitism and knowledge, I'm just going to pick up on those two, uh, those two words. Elitism, by definition, the converse is obviously inequality. Okay? Inequality or discrimination. Okay? And, and knowledge, we know what knowledge is. I mean, I think that's the fundamental. Anybody who wants power, uh, into people who believe in real politics and all the rest of it, if they have knowledge, they have power. And this is very, very important to understand because I think elitism, uh, which is related to inequality, has moved considerably. Okay, and I think because it's slightly, I'm not an authority on this, about just between socialism and capitalism, but I don't think that's relevant so much anymore. Okay, and I'll come to that in a second. I think inequality is really the root, and I'm not talking about gender discrimination and this like immigration discrimination and all the rest of it. I'm talking about economics. How did, how did inequality start? And, and communication, as you rightly said, is very, very important. Uh, inequality today, and this is the ironic thing, is not so much about one nation versus another nation. Thankfully, with India, China developing the way they, they have done and are doing, or indeed Latin America and parts of Sub Saharan Africa. I think it's very different today. It's not so much global inequality between the economies of different nations. In fact, today, poverty is different me as I look at it, okay? Uh, it, it more has to do, it has to do less so ironically, though that's what's created it. Global inequality got removed between economies because you just moved your, because of the cost of production, low cost of production, you just moved it out to a place like China or India, where you could uh, uh, you know, produce your goods at a lower rate, right? So that removed that so-called inequality between nations. But that ironically created domestic inequality. Because now you've got a tiny section of the so-called elite who are extremely rich and getting richer and richer and richer. Where you, where you find the poorer people, and indeed, I would arguably say even the middle class, is stagnant in terms of you know, the standard of living. And, and that's where the real inequality is coming in. Where you've got a tiny elite, which is just 
you know, growing extremely rich in the poorer sections. Indeed, even the middle class is completely staggering. Now, I, I think individuals uh, have a lot to play today. In, in, back in the old days, it was easier, lack of communication, village councils decided everything. Then you had agriculture developing, you got the industrial revolution that you talked about. Now we're in a post-industrial society, okay, where people, whereas in the latter part of the, you know, 19th century and the early part of this century and the middle part of this century, people talked about teamwork, groups. Okay, when you think about guys like, you know, your people like Walpurth and Drucker and all these other guys, they were more talking in terms of how efficient an organization is and how efficient management is, as opposed to, you know, spectacular talents of few individuals. But I think we're back to the age of the Rockefellers, people like you, uh, you know, back to the innovators, back to the back to the guys who are the entrepreneurs. And, and, and that's where they, through thought leadership, through using social, uh, how should I say, social programs, okay? I mean, you've got the CSR, you've got, you know, I, I know you've talked about microfinance. There's micro uh, housing, uh, uh, you know, groups around the world. You've got this Brazilian program that I talked about. How do you bring that into actual corporate thinking? I think those are the ways that individuals and elites have to move because otherwise we are creating that disparity which is just growing bigger and bigger. And, and I think that is something that you know, people like you, I know you're in this, need to be thinking about, I think, why. If I may, yes, react to your comments. Um, you're spot on with uh, this is a big R versus G conversation around the inequality. If you look at the last 40 years, the return on capital, the return on technology, and people who control factors of factors of uh, production with technology, the return on capital has consistently grown. Um, but the return on labor has not. In fact, inflation adjusted return on labor is completely stagnant and in some regions has gone down. So and that is pointing to a white meat that would be the rich and poor. I can tell you from where I stand and where I what I can see at Singularity University, we're an impact organization. Um, a lot of corporates approach us with the idea of understanding exponentially growing technologies and applying those technologies for bottom line conversations, for bottom line outcomes. And ultimately, they tend to emerge from these conversations. And this is a prevalent theme now in Silicon Valley. Uh, they tend to emerge well beyond CSR, corporate social responsibility. They were beginning to see the opportunity to align social impact with the bottom line at a very concrete level. Um, and I'm talking about new companies coming to us. I mean, you couldn't get as far away from social impact as a beer company, right? And then they emerge and saying, there is an opportunity to be aligned here. If we do good, we will make a lot of profit. We always say, uh, the best way to make a billion is to help a billion people. For the first time in human history, I truly believe the world's biggest problems are also the world's biggest business opportunities. And through technological empowerment, I'm, I'm very optimistic that the issues that you rightfully raised um, could, could be written out and moving in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Chia Kim Wat. <coughs> sorry, Chia Kim Wat, who's the regional head, Raja Tan. It's a leading law firm of Singapore. He has been recognized as one of the leading lawyers by many organizations. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege to be among so many eminent uh, panelists. Uh, having the benefit of hearing uh, all the former panelists' speeches, I'd like us to share three observations. Uh, the first one is about problem solving. I think we have all been looking at solving problems. When somebody is poor, we give money. When somebody is sick, we give medication. I'd like to shift that paradigm a little bit to look at what I call problem avoidance. If we can avoid the problem, then there's really no need to solve it. And why do I say that? If the poor, for example, the ambassador mentioned there's now somebody who show a $12,000 loan and he committed suicide, yeah, I'm sure I give him 12000 But why did he end up with a 12000 loan in the first place? Is it a lifestyle thing? He had too many children that he couldn't support. If you could understand the problem and help the person to avoid the problem, then maybe there's no need to solve it. And, and that also uh, echoes with what uh, Mr. Amin said, mentioned about the world being in, ab in abundance of resources and why are we poor in resources. Uh, it brings to mind what our uh, so-called emeritus minister, city ministers mentioned, uh, Mr. Ko Chow Tong, years ago, 
They say that in Singapore, they couldn't understand why energy is uh, so scarce. They say that in many of our homes, we blast aircon at night at 20, 22 degrees, and then we put over thick blanket, three inch thick. And if you just remove the blanket and open the windows, then you actually don't need to use the aircon and you save energy. So, so it's really how you look at the problem. If you are trying to chase resources, chase, chase solutions, you may not get to the end of it. Sometimes it's a bit spiritual. Change the way you think, change the lifestyle you lead, and you could solve a lot of problems. The second point I want to share with you is the education system. I think all of us in Singapore, from Singapore, I would say, to Beijing in China or to Delhi in India, we are taught how to solve problems. We are taught by uh, completing exam questions, by choosing what is the best answer, not the only answer. Many a times, if I look at my children's uh, uh, test papers these days, I look at the question, I think all of them are possible answers, but they are only taught one best answer. Not that the others are wrong, but because this is the best answer. And in order to achieve that, they have to do a lot of test papers in order to see which is the best answer in those situations. And unfortunately, in our lives, we have been raised that way. We are taught how to find the best solution. Instead of picking out the box to say there could be other solutions. And I think our recent uh, new acting minister for education, uh, Mr. Ng, mentioned that we have to change our education system to develop innovators and value creators. Because in this information age, having knowledge itself is not sufficient. You need to innovate and create value. Because knowledge, everybody has. How to do things, everybody knows. You just go to Google it. You know? In fact, I'm a lawyer by training. If you want a contract, I'll say Google it and half the time you find a contract you want, you know. So what do lawyers then bring? We have to bring value, yeah, rather than just producing the documents. So I think the education system itself needs to go through an overhaul to, in order to, to, to create the value. And the third observation that I would like to share with you is about the topic, you know, using knowledge to create wealth. In my view, and I agree with what Mr. Arvin said, uh, Technology is the greatest game changer and equalizer. I mean, for those who are the poor, why are they poor? Because of information, because of access to technology. Can you imagine a poor farmer, which I think a few of them mentioned, and you have to pay a hundred percent so-called interest rate, but if they have access to the marketplace, they have access to crowdfunding, then they have access to the information, they have access to the resource, they will lower their cost. I mean, now in the village, they have to sell to a lot of middlemen, and that's why the products just cost 50 cents when it goes to the market, it costs $50. But if they access to the marketplace, which what Alibaba profess to do, then you could actually make everybody uh, wealthier. So, wealth creation is not just creating financial wealth, it's actually creating access to knowledge and access to resource. Down to education. I mean, we don't have to build schools, we don't have to deploy teachers in a remote place so that the remote students in the hills and the tribes can be educated. No, we just will give them a laptop. Just one laptop can teach a whole village. Why a laptop and a screen that you see just now? All of us could be in the village, you know, and listening to that great professor from Atlanta, and we are all educated. You just need to use technology to reach out to the masses so that you can be more efficient. Yeah, those are my three observations. Uh, we have Nitin Gupta. He's partner of Transaction Advisory, Ernest & Young India. In fact, he leads the investment banking initiatives for Ernest & Young India. Nitin. Thank you, Preeti. Uh, uh, so I've been hearing everyone and quite a few of my thoughts. Uh, I've been reflecting upon, I think, pretty much similar to a lot that's been said. I think it's also given a lot of food for thought. But I'll focus on what I see more on a regular basis, uh, interacting with corporate clients like uh, Dr. Modi and uh, uh, Spice Group, right? which is that I think uh, there are two observations that I had is that, uh, like what you said, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of what we see in corporate presentations is about the CSR initiatives that they have taken. Right. And a lot of investor presentations these days actually have started increasing their uh, share of pages in the investor presentations from 1 to maybe 10 around CSR. Right. I think uh, what, what I do realize is that probably what they need to do is stop thinking about CSR, stop thinking about philanthropy, 
I rather start thinking about something as we call as conscious capitalism, which is more about uh, uh, rather than doing instead of saying doing good to look good, right? You start doing it's a good business, right? So something that's that's one of my thoughts. And the second one, I am a strong believer. That's at a personal level. And I am a strong believer that I believe uh, any program for poverty elevation or any other uh, social impact program cannot be sustainable in the long term if it's not uh, profitable or uh, it's not uh, self-sustainable. Right. So something that's uh, a term which you would have probably often heard, something called social entrepreneurship. Right. So you have to start thinking of business models. Right, wherein you have the ability to raise capital, generate return on capital, to be able to run those programs. Right, if you leave it to charity or philanthropy, so either of the three, two things will happen: a, it will die its natural death, or the quality will suffer significantly to be able to really achieve its objective. So these are two of my thoughts. Thanks. And the last speaker for the day, Sanjeev Iyer, who is the he is the president alumni association of IIM and IIT. Hi, uh, happy to to all. Uh, great to be amongst uh, so many of you. Uh, just uh, before I get started on my my observations, uh, there, there is the, I represent the IAM alumni community in Singapore, uh, probably the largest single city presence of alumni outside of uh, India, about 1800 or so. Just as an aside for your benefit, since it's uh, Stanford and Harvard, we like to say that it's harder to get into IIM than it is in Harvard. But I stopped saying that since my daughter got into Harvard business. So, uh, uh, but anyway, jokes aside, since the topic is uh, uh, elitism and uh, education was mentioned earlier, so there, there are a couple of things that uh, come to my mind. And quite a lot has already been said as far as the the poor people are, are concerned about the uh, capacity and capability building versus the charity aspect of it. And I absolutely agree with that, that you do need to uh, bring them above the poverty line where they themselves are bringing uh, themselves out of that versus someone, someone else uh, pulling them up uh, because that's uh, more sustainable. But when it comes to elitism, uh, I'll, I'll, one of the things is I think of uh, Technology-based elitism. There, there is a belief that uh, technology is a, is a panacea. So uh, everything is about technology, and uh, a fair number of times that got mentioned today as well. Within that, specifically, I'll say information technology. I come from the IT industry. I was in Hewlett Packard. I was in Singtel. So the full ICT spectrum. But still, I'll say there is elitism associated with that, which is that you look at the valuation of the companies that. Uh, that uh, that are IT related versus somebody trying to do something in agriculture as an example. I'm sure Venkat can relate to this. Uh, or uh, uh, even healthcare was talked about uh, earlier and so on and so forth. So there is a belief or a segment of population that believes and they they created their successes through information technology. They in turn are in a position they have the wealth and therefore that religion comes in. So in turn they are influencing the next step, which, which once more is, if you have something to do with IT, then fine, come talk to me. If not, then go away. So there is elitism. Uh, I'm just stating uh, uh, context here, what the solution is, we need to figure that out. The other, when it comes to education, and I know this got talked about many times, access to information. So today, a very young kid could just Google and pretty much find anything. But our education systems have stagnated. Uh, let me take it all the way up to MBA. Um, whether it's uh, Harvard, Stanford, IIM, or whatever, the, the way MBA is, is delivered is, has stayed pretty similar. I, mean, uh, I, I did it uh, more than three decades ago, but uh, not much has changed. The actual content may have, but approach hasn't. Let me relate that to the other observation. Cognitive systems are coming in, so it's not just so much productivity, it is about, in fact, we are thinking of having a panel and a session which is about future of bankers, not future of banking, future of bankers, because some of these systems could very well take over what the very high-powered knowledge people today do. So 
what about education then? Because then we're creating a new class class of poverty. I mean, in a relative sense, I don't quite mean those who, who go hungry, but uh, they probably don't get the whatever kind, kind of meal that they are. I, I, the, the final point I, I want to make is there was a mention about poor in the uh, uh, East being uh, different from the rest. Uh, and, uh, uh, I, I want to relate that to slightly different uh, observation, which is a elitism of innovation. Most of the innovation tends to get looked at uh, by Western standards or people who are educated in a Western mode, inclusive of people like me. But there is a lot more innovation that can happen and is happening in countries like India, Indonesia, Africa, and so on and so forth. Uh, Mission to Mars of uh, India being, the, of course, the ultimate example of that. But there is plenty of everyone. There are entrepreneurs and, entre uh, and uh, businessmen. There is, uh, I, I'm not going to name the company, but uh, one in, in India, where picking something from the interior part of uh, India uh, for saris uh, and uh, making that into the mainstream. And this is now catering to the ultra rich, that, that particular brand. In, in the process, all the people from the artisans to weavers and so on, everybody has been brought considerably up the economic value chain. This guy didn't start it as a CSR. He saw it as a business proposition and, and, and did it. So again, what I'm saying is innovation exists in many different forms and we should stop looking at it from just a single lens of, uh, of what that means in a developed country context and in fact, if we are not careful, some of the innovations coming from the emerging countries could very well uh, overtake and destroy what we conventionally believe. So those, those, I think all of those, we somehow knit those into the way we think of education for the future. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've definitely had very interesting session today, some key issues raised and possible solutions discussed. And I think as professionals, uh, we should pledge that as responsible citizens of civil society and the world, we should focus on widening the impact of our professional achievements to include those who need our help today, either by economically or technologically empowering them. Um, I really once again thank all the dignitary speakers, audience who have taken out time, especially on a public holiday, to come here today. I now request Mr. Dilip Modi uh, to give his closing remarks and word of thanks. Sorry, just, just before you do if I could just give a completely radical perspective. I think we're doing it, right? If, if you go back through history, um, all these wonderful concepts, ideas, have all been talked about before, right from the time of Aristotle, through all civilizations, through all cultures, um, and through all societies, whether they are Eastern, Western, one has always been more powerful than the other through every epoch of time. The thing that worries me is 40 years down the line, we're all going to go. Right? Look around the room. I, I think to be um, deep down in my heart, I'm a technologist, I'm a geek, I'm a futurist, and I'm a populist. The one thing I try and do every day is expose my children to small elements of things they need to think about today. My son is 13 and daughter is 7. They have no concept of poverty. They have no concept of life without Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi goes down for 10 minutes. It's a revolution. What we actually need to do is expose our children to start thinking of these things and look at different perspectives on how they should think about these things and so forth. Because if my son is going to get um, exposed to this for the first time when he's 40, we're doomed. I think the education systems and the knowledge that we need to actually share is around creating wealth. How would they create wealth? What sort of occupations they will enter? How they maximize their opportunity? And that should be our true legacy. Because if our, if our legacy is what we do today and it stops there, then guess what? We just repeat the same cycle every other generation before us has. I think educating our children to think differently, come from a different perspective, look at every problem in a different way, and understand. And you know, it's not going to be pleasant understanding poverty. 
I can tell you that. The first time my son went to Mumbai and saw Islam, he was like, you're kidding me. And I'm like, no, this is real. Right? The video games you play and all the stuff you see on, in cinemas, etc., is just a flavor. This is the real world. And I think our legacy has to be that we educate the next generation. Yes, we'll do our bit today and the next five, ten years. Might get bored of it, might not. But I believe technology is a game changer. And I believe the next generation applying that technology, understanding it better than us, is a real game changer. Thank you. session for me personally and I'm sure it's been for all of you over here. Uh, you know, I, I work been working in the telecom sector in India for the past 20 years. And when I hear about this topic, uh, it's, it's really interesting for me to reflect back uh, 20 years back when, you know, in India no one had a mobile phone. And 20 years out, nearly 900 million people in India had a mobile phone. And, uh, you know, as I see it, uh, you know, sitting where I work from in India, uh, we're going through a silent revolution ourselves. You know, there have been three big movements that have happened. You know, one is the mobile revolution. Uh, 900 million people with a mobile phone. It means they can talk to each other. They can talk to anyone in the world. The second thing that's happened is uh, the government has managed to give a unique identity to over 600 million people in our country through the Aadhaar program. You know, we talk about the poor, but you know, in a world where you, you know you don't even know who's you know where they are, who they are, and you know, children are being born every day. It's and poorer families tend to, tend, to, tend to have more kids. And you don't even know. So in India, the Aadhaar program has led to a unique identity being given to 600 million people. And the idea is to have everyone have a unique identity. And the third thing is to get everyone to have a bank account. So now I think, uh, which I'm right, about 200, 200 million people have bank accounts. Yeah. Now the uh, uh, Janman Yojana, which the government of India has done. So if you effectively put together these three movements, you know, 900 million mobile phones, 600 million unique identity, and now everyone having a bank account. The point that was being mentioned about privilege of direct benefits transfer, you know, money going from the government to a citizen, you know, having a unique identity and a bank account, uh, is happening. And, uh, you know, I, I believe next 10 years it's going to happen, uh, the way the mobile revolution happened. We are going through a big debate in India right now. Been to India last one week, you have seen in all the economic time dailies, there is a campaign being run by Facebook on digital equality. And uh, we are having this big debate in India on net neutrality. And uh, should everyone have access to free internet? You know, someone mentioned about Wi Fi. You know, in India, people are talking about free internet. Free education was one point that was mentioned, but free internet. And there's a big debate that's happening in India right now on, on this issue. Right? And you have a company like Facebook who is coming out with full-page advertisements in India saying India needs digital equality. You know, you have someone like Mark Zuckerberg coming to India saying, uh, you know, everyone should have access to the internet. But there is an issue of trust because when we talk about abundance and we talk about wealth, uh, we talk about more, we don't talk about all. You know, so, so the concept is when someone is saying it, what is in it for them? Right? So there's, there's this huge discourse that's happening in the public and the narrative is, well, there must be something to benefit Facebook. So it's not about, you know, and, and Professor mentioned it, if you want to earn a million, uh, you know, do it for a million. You know, it's not coming with that thought. So the discourse is not around that. It's about saying, you know, it's definitely benefiting someone. And therefore, you know, who does it benefit and who does it not benefit? So it's very interesting that we, we, we are having this conversation here in Singapore. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, People here will, will reflect on, on this conversation and, and hopefully, uh, you know, what Professor has reminded us, the fact that we live in an abundant world, the fact that, you know, we have technology that can empower, the fact that social services need to be extended, and eventually can be aligned social impact to bottom line. And I, I, I think for me, the biggest takeaway is this whole concept of the opportunity to create a new type of education uh, that, that can address this issue of imagination, because we think what we've become, and I think in India, 
we're beginning to see a new revolution happen. And I'm sure that you know, going forward, as technology empowers more and more people in India and around the world, uh, we will be able to look at using knowledge not just to create wealth, which is the concept of more, but for all. And uh, with that, I must thank you all for taking time out and coming and spending the first day of the new year with all of us here. It's been wonderful. And thank you for the Reinventing our imagination and hopefully getting us to think differently and have a new sense of imagination as we walk out and face the new world. Thank you so much.